dun 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 We are New York. New York. No, I don't have it. I don't have it, Coke. I thought I would have the tune. I thought I could sing the Sinatra New York. The Yankees. We got to talk Yankees to lead off the week. What a clunky start to the show. Come on, Coca. Here we go. Count me in. 4 6 69. Boiling point. Nothing personal word of the day. It is Monday, 8 22 22. We're almost done with August. It's almost Labor Day. That's it. End of summer. Labor Day in the baseball calendar is a very significant day. I've told you that all the other days, April, we're good. Don't panic. Oh my God, we're 17 and 4 in April. We're 4 and 17. It's over. We're screwed. We're going to win it all. We're the greatest. Let's make trades. Let's add. Let's sell. Buy. Forget it. May. Everybody breathe. It's Memorial Day. Let's look at the standings for the first time. If we're really out of it, we're going to need a miracle, but there's still a chance and we'll storm the castle in June leading up to the trade deadline, end of July, or in this case, early August. Trade deadline. Who adds? Who doesn't add? What are they going to do after the deadline? How good are the Padres? The Brewers traded Hater. I can't believe it. It's the worst plan ever. Ah, it's okay. He stinks. But Labor Day, make no mistake, when you get to Labor Day in the Major League Baseball calendar, you've got one month left, September And you're either there or you're not. You're getting ready to send out playoff invoices. You want to be within five games of a playoff spot so you can send out those invoices and take your money and use it for cash flow. You start planning postseason. You form committees within your organization to figure out the parties and figure out ticket prices and all the other things you're going to do. It's an exciting time. If you're out of the race, you start planning spring training. Who are you going to fire? I mean, assuming you're not the Texas Rangers. Who are you going to fire? Who are you going to bring back? Players, staff, player development, scouts. You're going through everything. But what about the Yankees in September? I've been spending all weekend thinking about this because I've watched Aaron Boone, who played for me. I've known him for a very long time. He is the person who I said would not be retained after last season. He got retained, both he and Cashman. This was a critical season, and they started off, he was... Monument Park bound. The Yankees were off to the greatest start ever. It's the greatest team ever. They're a juggernaut. They're not going to lose. They're going to win 127 games. It's going to be amazing. Then all of a sudden, they started losing some games. No big deal. Everybody's got to lose. Everybody loses a game. Then a few more games. Then a few more games. And now there's panic. Panic in the Bronx to the point where New York fans did their best Philadelphia imitation this weekend, booing like crazy, booing everybody. Paul O'Neill gets his number retired. Was he there, Coca? Because I know he can't be in the booth because he's not vaccinated. Did he actually, was he allowed in the stadium? I guess it's outdoors. He can go to the stadium. I guess you don't have to be vaccinated anymore. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. He shows up. Hal Steinbrenner, no Steven, not Hank. Hal Steinbrenner goes on the field, gets booed. Brian Cashman goes on the field, gets booed. I'm very used to this. I went on the field to present things on opening day, to present things during the course of a season when there'd be a no-hitter or when Icho got his 3,000th. You get, when you're an executive, you're generally going to get booed. Even like after a World Series, you let one guy go, two guys go, boo. I was okay with that. I like the emotion. Never bothered me. But when you're an executive, you hear it. You say you don't. When you're a manager, you hear it. All the heckling from above the dugout, all the whistling. I mean, Tony La Russa manages according to what people yell at him. But other people, you hear it, you ignore it. Sometimes you engage. And every once in a while, you hit a boiling point. A boiling point when you are an executive or a manager is when you cannot help yourself when there's a microphone in front of you and you have violated the 30-minute rule. The 30-minute rule, as you know, don't make any decisions within 30 minutes of a win or a loss. 
do not make any decisions based on emotion. You will make them wrong. When something happens and you want to immediately tweet, breathe. Read the tweet again. Send it to Coca. When something happens in a game that bothers you and you want to run and call the commissioner's office, you want to run and call the beat writers, that's the group of people who used to follow your team. Now you can just go on the inter-Google and write something. But you always have a microphone. And in baseball, the manager, part of his job is meeting the media. Aaron Boone meets the media Saturday after another Yankee loss, maybe their third shutout in five games, whatever it was. And boy, did he hit his boiling point. He was pounding the table. And what managers are told by the front office is we want to show confidence, calmness. When you've got a team with a high payroll that has been performing very well that goes into a slump, it's very critical that you show not compassion, that you show basically that you're steadying the ship. It's the old flight attendant analogy. When there's turbulence, you don't want to see your flight attendant running up and down the aisles, screaming. You want to see your flight attendant sitting there, reading a book on his or her phone or their phone, serving drinks, whatever they're doing. When you're a bad team, and you're going through a horrific streak, sometimes the front office will sit with the manager and say, now, I want you to go in front of the media and I want you to embarrass our players. I want you to be angry. I want you to not be satisfied or complacent. We've got to show emotion now. When you're a bad team that has a good streak, we'll say, get into the media and say, this is the type of improvement. Go look at Derek Jeter's comments after every victory. This is what he did. He was very good at this. This is what we're talking about. This is the type of growth. This is what fans should expect and that we expect. And we are very excited for our future. That's a bad team having a good streak. A great team with a bad streak should not have done what Aaron Boone did. And Aaron knows better, but he hit the boiling point. Because in that clubhouse, they see the video. The players know exactly what your manager does in front of the media because all of the TVs have the post-game press conference because the players want to know what the manager is saying, what the questions are, word gets around. And when you're trying to send a message, you can do it through a clubhouse meeting, you can do it through a one-on-one -on -one meeting, or you can do it through the media. But when you're a team like the Yankees, and I don't say that because they're the Yankees. I don't say that because of their payroll. I say that because of the way they have performed and the streak that they are on right now. Yes, they have the worst second half record or something. Second worst in the American League. They're 10 games under in the second half. They've regressed. You know I don't call it the second half. It's post-All-Star break. Their starters who were outstanding to start the season. I told you it wouldn't last. It hasn't lasted. Their starters have just fumbled and bumbled since the All-Star break, almost a five ERA. Everything, they can't hit, they can't pitch. And no matter what team you are, when you can't hit or pitch, you're not gonna win. It just, it simply doesn't matter what your payroll is. But as a organization, you have to know that none of this matters. Yes, the Yankees lead is from 13 to eight. Yes, the Yankees will have to play a game seven on the road if the Astros are in the LCS because I don't believe they'll catch the Astros. All of that is true. But baseball is not like basketball. Although, look what the Mavericks did to the Suns last year when they went in for a game seven and crushed the home team. The home team obviously has a bigger advantage in a game seven in the NBA. But in Major League Baseball, we never really look at that. You'd rather be at home because it's more comfortable in your bed. Some players would rather be on the road. They're more comfortable in someone else's bed. All of that is to say, home field advantage, eh, you want it, but it's not the end-all, be-all. So the New York Yankees, their problem is not their recent slump. Their problem is their roster construction. And that is why there was no reason for Aaron Boone to hit the boiling point because nothing's actually changed. They are performing the way that people who know baseball looked at the team and said, this is the team you have. But when you start off and have a stretch of games, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 games, 
where you are playing far above what your expectations were, you remember what we talked about, which is you have that moment when you're meeting with your GM, manager, and owner, when you're during a season, and you say to yourself, were we wrong? Is it time to go for it because we thought we wouldn't be good, but we are good? Did we think we were gonna be good? We haven't played well, but we think we're good, so we're gonna wait for us to be good again. We don't need to add too much. You go through the evaluation process and you decide whether or not your previous evaluation process was accurate. If you are a team that has played very well, you've evaluated yourself that you are gonna be a World Series team. Yes, we're talking about the Yankees. Then you play up to that, if not better, then you have a stretch where you don't, your evaluation of your team does not change. Brian Cashman is not saying to Hal Steinbrenner, we don't have the right team. Hal Steinbrenner is not saying to Brian Cashman, I can't believe it. We're not ready to win. This is absolutely outrageous. What are we going to do with Judge? What's going on with our payroll? What should we do with Giancarlo? Is he ever going to get back on the field? Maybe our starting pitching isn't good. We shouldn't have traded Jordan Montgomery. Where's Harris in Bader? That's just not what's happening which is why the booing doesn't impact him. But Aaron Boone losing his temper at the podium Saturday, it made me think that there's a level of panic in the clubhouse that I wouldn't have expected from a veteran team. Because what Aaron Boone did was to motivate his players, was to wake his players up, it was not from a lack of calculation, what he did. It wasn't emotional. He decided to take the microphone after Saturday's loss and go scorched earth. Then, yesterday, this is good. The Yankees salvaged the series against the Blue Jays. They win a game. And fans get to say, look, it was Aaron. He got those guys going. <laughs> Makes me laugh. It really does. Where's all the people who are calling for Aaron Judge to make $70 million a year? Where are they now? Are they good? Does it matter that over 10 games, he's like four for his last 30 or something? Hasn't hit a home run in God knows what, a week? 10 days? Oh, he's going to get 90 home runs. He's going to break Bonds' record. His balls are juiced. Where are you guys now? That's nah, just a slump. Don't worry. So one of the things that we try very hard to do, very hard, is we try not to say the quiet part out loud. I do on nothing personal, but as an executive in baseball, it's like what you're taught when you get into the game. They sit down with you and say, okay, you're in this very exclusive club. Everyone wants to be you. You're going to be loved. You're going to be hated. But don't do the following things. And then he pulls out an Ace Ventura wallet. And there's like a hundred things you can't do. They can be summed up by don't say the quiet part out loud. It's a great expression. Then, of course, when you're out of baseball, you can start a podcast called Nothing Personal. And boy, you can say the quiet part out loud. Always the danger when you fire someone that they're going to go scorched earth. And it's interesting because when I fire people, I will change the severance agreement language according to my view of what I think the reaction will be of the person fired. If I think that we've got a problem, not because we've done anything, but because there is a level of bitterness that is significant, the severance language, which is the language that you put in a separation agreement in order to give someone severance in return for them shutting up. So you do a calculation of severance, how much money you're willing to give. You do it based on sort of what you've done in the past, but there are exceptions. And then the language that you do with your employment lawyers is based on your view of the employee. When Joe Madden got fired by the Anaheim Angels of Los Angeles, it was my opinion that he would likely not manage again. He wants to manage again. He believes he'll manage again. And when I am with a manager who I don't think is going to manage again, I am 
slightly concerned, depending on the personality, about what's going to come out of his mouth, both right after the firing and then down the line. Like, I'm always anxious the first winter meetings after a managerial firing because the manager you fired likely got another job as a coach in another organization, and they may go to the winter meetings, which in the old days was just a sewing circle of gossip, and then you hear things up in the suite. I try never to go to the lobby in the winter meetings, right? You want to stay there and work. When you go to the lobby, you're just going to be seen, and you're going – sometimes you go from room to room, and you have to go to the lobby. Sometimes you want to be seen when you're making trades or signings, and you want there to be buzz around your team. But generally, it's strategic. I did not think Joe Madden would do what he did this weekend. Joe Madden, the World Series manager – World Series winning manager for the Chicago Cubs in 2016. The great manager for the, he was with the um, Tampa Bay Rays, got him to the World Series, won it in Chicago, then went to Anaheim. Great guy. Larry Beinfest gets all the credit in the world. He would have been the Marlins manager before he managed the Devil Rays when he was a coach. I believe, Coca, was Joe Madden a coach with the California Angels? I believe that's where he was when we wanted to hire him, and uh, we weren't allowed to. So Joe Madden this weekend says how disappointed he is, and he starts talking about the front office and the relationship with the front office and the field. For you, as a listener of Nothing Personal, none of it was surprising. I've told you the involvement the front office has. I've told you that we go to managers and say, this is who you're going to play. This is where they're going to bat. This is what the pitching rotation is going to be. This is when pitching changes are going to happen. Hey, you have a gut instinct? Negative. We're going to go through it all with you. Joe Madden said, it's at the point where some GM should really just put a uniform on and go down to the dugout or their main analytical membrane. He should go down to the dugout. (laughs) We tried that. We put our GM in the dugout. Didn't quite work. He was talking about how disappointed he was in California with the involvement of his new GM, a guy named Perry, who was brought in by Artie Moreno to try to spend his money wisely and try to deal with him and try not to have him meddle so much that the team can't win. And it didn't work. And the reason why Joe Madden should not have said this is that if he has a opportunity to manage again, the owner is going to ask the GM or president of baseball operations for his, or if it's the Marlins, her approval, buy-in. You need some sort of simpatico between your GM and your manager. We've seen it with teams where they don't get along and it doesn't last. Something's got to give. If Joe Madden goes into an interview and he is at the point where no matter what his career is, no matter what his resume is, no matter who you are, you go meet the owner and the GM when you are going to become a manager. Even if the owners told you, right, that this is who we're hiring, there's still an interview process. You don't want to walk into an interview no matter what your pedigree is when you are looked at as anti-front office. And you may think this is just a pro front office point of view, right? Because I'm formerly of the front office. But no, why would you ever go into an interview in any company you're working for or trying to work for? And your initial position in your interview is defending the fact that you have been on record that you don't like working with your boss or with your boss's boss. Why exactly is that someone who you'd want to hire? Picture you're hiring someone and you sit down in an interview and they walk in and sit down and, hi, I see from your resume, you're very qualified to build these widgets. Yes, I am. Look at all this experience. I'm a widget builder. But I also understand that you don't work well with others and that you tell your shift boss to bugger off every other day. Ooh, how'd you know that? Mm, I think I'm gonna find someone else who builds widgets. I don't need that level of service. So it's not just baseball. Not sure why Joe Madden was doing that. But I can promise you one thing, the impact that it will have on his managerial career is significant because they're all paying attention. And they don't want an old school manager who is not willing to do what he's told. 
Yes, I'm talking about you too, Joe. You're done. No more dugouts for you. No soup for you. All right, Coca. We got to spend some time on this thing you told me to watch. I finally got to it yesterday. I watched the entire, I did it, all seven hours. Yes, I did. Under the banner of heaven. We come back, we're going to review it, and we're going to picture a dystopian Handmaid's Tale world where Tom Brady is living in the penthouse suite of the Cosmopolitan. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's Monday, August 22nd, 2022. Please take the time, hit pause for like 10 seconds and follow us, rate us, review us, wherever you're listening to this. If you'd like to see anything new in the background on set, go to Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel and subscribe. Yes, there's gonna come a time here soon. We're gonna do more live stuff. We're gonna be more active. You gotta build your video following, Dave. Thank you. So I watch things, you give me suggestions. Coca, when he suggests things to me, his batting average, I would say is probably 950. That's how good he is when he tells me to watch something. I tried watching one thing. There's only been one thing, Coca, that I that you told me to watch that I only watched one episode and I couldn't get through it. And I can't remember for the life of me what it was, but it was a series about people who go to homes as caterers and they they put on parties at people's homes. I don't remember what it's called. Oh, Party Down. Thank you. I got through like one episode and I couldn't do it, so I stopped. But other than that, Coca, you're batting a thousand. So under the banner of heaven, I sat down and watched it. If you don't know what it's about, it's Andrew Garfield in an American accent as a detective in Utah, working with Gil Birmingham, who you know from Yellowstone, playing a detective, a Native American detective, because he's Native American. And that is important to the story. And it's about a murder that takes place amongst the Mormons. And it's based on a true story. And I gotta talk to you about a concept here. Without getting too religious, I'm just spitballing here. Whatever God you believe in, I'm trying to figure out what kind of God it is that would tell you that it's okay to kill someone. You're doing it in the name of God. I just can't figure it out for the life of me. And I'm not trying to preach. I'm not a member of the cloth of any religion. I'm Jewish, but I'm not a rabbi. I like non-Jewish people, but I'm not a priest or a bishop or a cardinal. I like cardinals. I like Manzu. Google it. Manzu, cardinal, artist. I just have never been able to figure that out. It's the same thing with players who thank God when they hit a home run and they cross themselves. Pudge used to cross himself before every pitch. But I always want to believe that God doesn't care if you strike out or hit a home run, that God's got other stuff to do than figuring out whether you're going to win your game or be good at your sport. Some people say God isn't even around anymore because he, she, they, whatever God is, looks at earth and looks at the way we treat each other and says, wow, this sort of went sideways. All of that is possible. I'm watching Under Banner of Heaven and I'm thinking about Josh Gad. I'm thinking about Book of Mormon. I'm looking at these people who are going on missions and they look crazy to me. They're violent, they're misogynists, they're criminals, they're polygamists. I mean, listen, polygamy for me, I don't know why you need the paper. <laughs> if you're gonna be with 10 women, just don't be married. Seems like a good plan. Right? No one no one calls. What's the name? Oh, Coca, are you with me? There is a recording artist who has like 12 kids with 10 women. I wanted to say Nick Cannon. And I don't know why I want to say that. He's the one who was married to uh, Mariah Carey. Oh, my God. I'm right. God, my Coca. I'm sorry. To everyone in my life. I grant you that I'm on my phone way too much. 
Not as much as I was before Africa. And my brain, I don't remember things that matter, like moments with people and memories. I have this affliction. Now we're getting slightly personal for a second here, Coca. I have a weird thing that when I think about my past, I only remember bad stuff. Or when I, th- it's weird. I can remember every fight I ever had with whoever. And I don't fight with friends, but, and I, or, or an experience on a trip, which was bad. And I'll think about that instead of all the great parts. And that's something I'm really trying to do better at. It's way, way smarter to remember the good things and suppress the bad things. I suppress the good things. It makes no sense. I'm getting help for that and it's semi working, semi. If you're gonna be a polygamist, just be Nick Cannon. So this entire series, I'm thinking about Mormons and Book of Mormon and I'm thinking about, is this what all Mormons are like? Cause I've been to Utah and I've met tremendously nice Mormons. But does that mean that they're nice to me, but then behind my back, they're criminal? Or are they just like anybody else where there's some criminal part to it? A few bad apples, don't let one bad apple spoil the batch. And is that what every murder is? Is that what every cult is? Is that what every Scientologist is? Where you just don't want to let, hey, don't let one religion spoil the batch for all cults. I can't wrap my arms around it though. Because I've had these conversations with people who do have religious beliefs that are way stronger than I do. And what strikes me about every one of these conversations is the conviction they have of knowing the unknown is staggering. I've never met people who believe they know something that cannot be known more than religious people. Okay. Tell me I'm wrong. You have proof? Show me. I'm a math guy. I want the proof. Show me John Smith and his third book. I've got maggots in my scrotum. That's from Book of Mormon. Under the Banner of Heaven is worth your watch because Andrew Garfield, as you know, is one of my favorite actors and he's so good. It's a very fascinating story and it is sad. It is strange. It is pathetic and it will make you wonder. And it's only seven hours under the banner of heaven. So heaven is something that if you believe in it, right, you want to do what's right. You want to try to make good decisions, whether you're religious or not. In theory, the whole purpose of religion or the purpose of good being a good person is either if there's an afterlife, you want to sort of be looked at when you're being judged and you've got in your Albert Brooks or Meryl Streep, right? You want to be looked at. Wow, this is good. I can defend this moment and that moment. But you also try to do things. <laughs> you try to do things that build your legacy or they're on point to what you think people think you should be doing. I'm talking about Dana White, who spends his life not paying his fighters. He spends his life getting involved with things, thinking that he is a BSD. And one of you had a question about it. You know what I want? (laughs) I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Hello. That's from the movie Half-Baked. We just got our report. So many new listeners to the podcast. So you want to talk to Samson. Go see the movie Half-Baked. Try to be at least 69% baked when you see it. There's a character named Samson and everyone wants to talk to him. If you want to talk to me, get on my Twitter at David P. Samson. I am way behind, but I promise you, I read, I try to answer as many as possible. Once in a while, you're going to make the show. David, hello. That's an awesome way to start. Why would Dana White get involved in Tom Brady's free agency? And by the way, where is Tom Brady? Hell yeah. That's a great question. Let's answer the second one first. Tom Brady went full Doug Henning. God, that's an old reference. Disappeared. Poof, he's supposed to be back today. For those of you who think that he went to film The Masked Singer, I'm gonna say it right now. If Tom Brady left training camp to film The Masked Singer, and that was a condition of him 
joining the Bucks after retiring was that, hey, I committed to film this show and I'm going to do it. My kids want me to do it. My wife wants me to do it. I want to do it. I think it's the greatest thing. He should not be allowed to throw shoulder pads on again. And you're talking about a guy who left his team to film Survivor. So I totally get that. The thing about the Masked Singer and Tom Brady, it wasn't his only chance. There is no chance that that's where he was. There, I'm on record. Tom Brady was not filming the Masked Singer. I don't know what he was doing, but it wasn't that. I wonder whether he'll answer. Do you know the reason why people are saying that's a theory is when you go on a reality show, you have to sign like hundreds of pages of documents and waivers and your family does, your work does, and everyone has to swear to secrecy. It's a confidentiality provision that if you violate, like if you tweet, hey, there's Tom filming The Masked Singer. Hey, where's Tom? He was filming The Masked Singer. You can actually get sued for damages by the production company and they'll do it because they want the surprise element because that's how they get paid. That's how the show makes money. So while there's been total silence, no one has seen or heard from Tom Brady in his absence. Is it possible he was filming? I'm saying yes, but no chance toilet pants. But what about Dana White? He's the guy from UFC, have you heard of him? Big articles in the last couple of weeks about all of the fact that he only gives 20% of industry revenue to his fighters. He says he'll never give more. There's all this. There's all these people who are calling him out, like uh, that guy who can't hit um, or throw a pass or shoot a basketball, but he boxes a little bit. He's the brother of the guy in Valley Girl, um, Paul Jake Jakeston or something. Jake Johnston, whatever. Some guy calls out Dana White saying, "You don't pay me enough. There's not enough money. Do better." He doesn't care. He's Dana White. For whatever reason, this weekend Dana White went public saying. I wasn't going to say this, but someone else did, so I'm going to give you some input on it and some color. I was the agent and the broker, and we were this close. I'm holding my fingers together really, really tightly, like so tightly you can't even see through it with a flashlight. So close to Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski going to the Las Vegas Raiders. We had a deal done, and I was doing it. And then John Gruden said no, backed away, backed off and said I'm not doing that deal. Dana White helped broker a deal to get Tom Brady to the Las Vegas Raiders when he was a free agent in 2020? What? Why? Because you're rich? Because you're famous? Because you have a lot of followers? Because you have dinner with Tommy and Giselle? As a president of a team, if I got approached, which happened so many times, Rest in peace, David Cassidy, but you know it. If you're listening to nothing personal from under the banner of heaven, you know how many times you came up to me in Miami trying to get a player brought over. Hey, that guy wants to be in Miami. Dude, you're David Partridge. How you doing? I'm not listening to you. Will you sing for me, though? Dana White walks up to the Raiders, says, hey, I got Tom Brady ready to come to you. You think the front office says to Dana, hey, that's awesome. Can we meet? I think I, we, we didn't know how to get to Tom. We had no way of speaking to him except for going through you, Dana. It's like it's a Christmas morning miracle. My chin just hit the microphone. I've never felt my chin hit something before. That was weird. Did you, did you see that, Coca? Sometimes I gesticulate so much doing the show that I raise my head up sort of like a turtle looking out to see what's happening. And sometimes my chin hits the microphone. It's a very strange feeling. Can you hear it? <laughs> the front office doesn't need a broker. Frankly, they don't need an agent. You think when Scott Boris sends me a book about Wei Yin Chen, oh my God, I never heard of Wei Yin Chen before. Or an agent gives you the name of a player. Hey, he's looking at three years. He's going to help your team. Oh, my God. Do you have a way to reach him? We can reach any player anytime in our sport. Any player at any time. You can tamper so easily it's a joke. You can just call up a guy. See him on the field. Fly to where they're playing. You know what team hotel. We get a list of where every team stays in every city. On every road trip. Tom? Hi, it's Mark. Yeah, Dana called me and said you want to be a Raider, do you? 
Give me a break. I don't have the first idea why Tom Brady was already looking at houses, according to Dana White. I have no idea why he's not on the Raiders except for Tom Brady going to the Raiders. It's preposterous. Dana White and his ego is why he got involved in Tom Brady, except it doesn't make him look powerful. It makes him look ridiculous. <sighs> Nothing personal pick of the day. We went two and one this weekend. We're 87 and 72. Friday, we had the Rays one and a half over the Royals on the run line. That worked out well. The Royals won the damn game. That's a loss. Saturday, we told you to bet on Cueto. Remember we said Al Cueto? I have no idea. I've spoken to people in the game. Old friends, new friends, fast friends, dear friends, were friends, more than friends. There is no explanation for how Johnny Cueto is having the season he's having with the White Sox. But you might as well ride it. They beat Bieber and the Guardians on Saturday. That's a win. And then yesterday was a give me. Padres over the Nationals. It was only 2-1, to one, but... God, the Padres offense. Ugh. But we're two and one. All right. What's the game tonight? You know what you're watching. Although you don't. It's funny. Someone came up to me this weekend, Coca, and asked me. I was at a wedding. And someone asked me about a Subway series and whether or not that's what baseball roots for. And the answer is no. Because they don't want to lose an entire half of the country because people west of the Mississippi don't really care about the Mets and Yankees. Um, and so they'd rather have a West Coast team and an East Coast team. Like Dodgers, Yankees would be the ultimate World Series for Major League Baseball and for the broadcasters. So you've got the Mets playing the Yankees tonight in a two-game series. The Yankees, who hit the boiling points, who are coming off a win, now have to walk into Scherzer and DeGrom. This is the game. Now, the Mets were not looking past the Phillies. They came back to win 10-9. They held them off 10-9. I didn't watch the game. I think Diaz gave up a run, though, Coco. Either way, the Mets are coming off a win. Doesn't matter. Yankees coming off a win. Doesn't matter. Steve Cohn, as owner of the Mets, talking about and tweeting about his team has heart or whatever he tweets about. Doesn't really matter. But these are the type of games when you are a new owner of the Mets, you want this. And you hesitate, so you speak to your GM and you say, hey, can you just get word down? This matters. Like, I need to beat the Yankees. And you've got Scherzer. Yeah, we're taking the Mets. I'm sorry, Coca. He hates when I pick the Mets. Choose the Mets. You pick your nose. You choose your friends. I apologize, Coca. But we're taking the Mets over the Yankees. So the other thing that happened this weekend that needs to be talked about is... Uh, what happened to Marcelo Zuna. Marcelo Zuna is a player who I have known since he became part of an organization. We drafted him, we signed him to an international, didn't draft, international sign. Part of the great outfield of Stanton Yelich Ozuna. Marcelo Zuna is someone who I have always respected and always loved. And I've been concerned about his behavior He's the same guy who I told you I would not sign to a long-term contract. I want to keep him hungry year to year. He always wanted the long-term deal. We offered him, against my wishes, a long-term deal that he and his agent, guess who his agent was, Scott Boras, turned it down. When he got arrested for domestic violence, that was not the Marcelo Zuna I know. Marcelo Zuna changed back in 2016. Marcelo Zuna's best friend was Jose Fernandez. And he has not in any way recovered from Jose's death. And that is not an excuse for his behavior in any way. There is no excuse for domestic violence. None. You deserve to be in prison. I don't care how sad you are how tortured you are, how sick you are, you deserve to lose your freedom. That's always been my view, and it will always be my view. Do not hit a woman, ever. He gets reinstated. He's suspended 20 games. He promises he's going to be 
a better person, a better man. And this weekend, he got arrested again for driving under the influence. My first reaction when I saw the news, which shows the growth I've had since I have been president of the team and I'm no longer president of the team, the old David has a very simple reaction. Hey, let's void his contract. He's in year two of like a $60 million contract. The new David, my first reaction was devastation, sadness. Is he going to be okay? Did anyone get hurt? Did he kill someone or himself? Is his fate going to be that of his best friend? What is happening? How do I reach him? How do I see him again? How do I grab him by the hand and say, Marcel, you're throwing it all away. Everything that you worked for, everything you wanted. We teach our players, if you're gonna get arrested, which you shouldn't, if you're gonna get DUI, which why, you all can afford Uber now. One drink is too many. I once had a player tell me I only had two beers, that was fine. No, you're not fine. You're a professional athlete, nobody should do it. But you are a target. Don't do it. It's stupid. It's dangerous, it's irresponsible. If you ever get pulled over, we would tell our players, Here's the first thing you do. You put your hands on the wheel. You then listen to everything the police say. They say get out of the car, you get out of the car. You tell them when you're gonna reach for your license, your insurance. Not because you're black, not because you're white or Hispanic, because I don't want any problems. Number two, do not do the Nimoli. The Nimoli, for those of you who are not indoctrinated, was the owner of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays who got pulled over for DUI and on camera said, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? I am the owner of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. That doesn't work. I just hit my chin again. That doesn't work. That's rule number two. Do not say, do you know who I am? They'll take your license, they'll do a search, and they'll know exactly who you are. You don't have to tell them. Ozuna was pulled over and immediately said, I'm Ozuna from the Braves. And extended his hand. I'm not sure why the policeman shook his hand. It's sort of weird. Extended his hand, and he still got arrested and the Braves played him last night. What is going on in Atlanta? I will give Alex Anthopoulos all the credit in the world for winning the World Series, for building the team he built, for making the right decisions, getting young players locked up. Terry McGurk, as the president of that team, dealing with the public entity which owns it, dealing with building the ballpark village and the ballpark, all the great things he's done. Where the hell were you yesterday? You can't put Marcelo Zuna in the lineup. You call up the commissioner of baseball, you find out what his suspension is. You put him on paid leave until he's suspended and you meet with the union to make sure it's okay. What kind of league the same day that MLB is playing in Williamsport, trying to make it good for kids to love your sport. And what are we teaching them? Ah. We're the NFL. You can beat the crap out of your wife. You can be a misogynist. You can be an assaulter. Don't worry. We'll pay you. We'll let you play. We'll suspend you for a minute and a half. And we'll take a year to do it. It's all good. Yeah, DUI. Nah, just do the normal comment. It's a legal matter, so we'll have no further comment. While we're disappointed in the behavior of our player, this is a legal matter. And we will wait for further comment for the legal proceedings to avail themselves. Horse hockey. You have to be proactive. There has to be zero tolerance. And yes, I'm talking about a friend. The Atlanta Braves are trying to void his contract and they should. But then they play him? Where are you, Rob? Dan? You can't let this happen.
Wait to see is when we tell you something's going to happen. When it happens, we revisit it. When it doesn't happen, we revisit it. On July 7th, I told you Eduardo Rodriguez would not pitch again this season. Thank you to all of the people on Twitter, on Instagram at David P. Sampson, on Tic Tac, nothing personal, dot MPDS, who reach out and tell us when we're wrong and when we're right. Eduardo Rodriguez did come back and he pitched for the Tigers yesterday. I was shocked. He left for personal reasons. He was gone for a couple months, maybe going through a divorce, not sure what, sort of like the Ben Zobris plan. Got to show that you want to be with your kids, but he's in the middle of a contract. I would think your kids and your ex-wife will want you to make as much money as possible and that a court would not hold it against you if you're trying to make a living. Well, Eduardo Rodriguez came back. I was shocked. I promise you, I revisit stuff because that's what I do for business. This is nothing personal. 